Okay, so we're here with Dr. Paul Anderson, naturopathic medical doctor for our Real Mushrooms Practitioner interview series. And Dr. Paul Anderson is an expert in the integrative and naturopathic clinical world, and he also specializes and has a focus in complex infections, oncology, chronic illness. He's also got two books relating to oncology, which we'll dive into further on our website, one called Outside of the Box Cancer Therapies. And he also has an online educational resource platform for practitioners called Dr. No, it's not doctor. It's consultdoctora.com. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So welcome to the, the interview, Dr. Paul. Thank, thanks for having me. Yeah, this is wonderful. We really appreciated your work and I appreciate your work as a naturopathic student doing the courses and all the CEs you <laughs> provide. So this will be great to dive into a great conversation on medicinal mushrooms, immune health, and possibly some oncology topics. So why don't you give us a little bit of a lowdown on personally how you became or personally got to where you are right now in the field you're in and that whole sort of linear progression if it was linear it's definitely non-linear so uh i i'll try and do the shortest version possible um so if you consider we're in uh 2021 right now i started to work in uh medical uh lab services in the 1970s so that was a long time ago and um at, at different points i kind of worked my way through college doing that all this stuff um at different points, I had, you know, thought of moving forward, going to allopathic medical school, all sorts of things. And, you know, life takes twists and turns. So uh, in and amongst that time, life happened and I just kind of stayed in that general world, uh, did a lot of other uh, kind of science related jobs. And then um, you fast forward to the uh, 1980s when my older children, my kids are all adults, but when their older kids were um, little, they got into this cycle that a lot of kids get into where they get the, you know, the allergies and, and uh, the ear infections and the antibiotics and then more ear infections and they get gut problems. That whole thing. My mother, who's a nurse, actually uh, told me that I should really take my daughter was having the worst time in to see this naturopathic doctor. And I thought, hmm, well, I had um, actually looked into naturopathic medicine way back. And there was NCNM, the school down in Portland, uh, which was, I lived near there. And it was just a little tiny, funky school. That's the one I went to, actually. It was in an old, decrepit grade school. And I thought, well, I remember this naturopathic idea, but I didn't really know much about it. So I went to this naturopathic doctor with my daughter. And he helped so much. And he, I mean, this is a guy from way back. He just knew so much about physiology and how that related to, you know, what was going on with my daughter at that time. I was just really impressed. And, and the results spoke for themselves. So then I started to see him because I had, you know, allergies and stuff like that. And I was just really impressed with this guy. And there came a point where I, at this point I owned my own lab. Um, this may not be the best career advice, kids, but uh, what I did was uh, sold my lab, okayed it with my wife first. I'm surprised she's still with me, but we sold everything, and I went back and finished. Instead of allopathic medical school, I, I went to NCNM to become a naturopathic doctor, and that changed everything. That's three decades ago now. So um, that just went on a really long trip that started. I, I was just one to be sort of a general family practitioner because my kids had been helped and I saw, you know, it helped young to old. But within like the first year or two, people realized, you know, I was there weren't a lot of nature paths in the town I was practicing in. Number one, there weren't a lot anywhere. And uh, so I started to get people who were either really chronically ill or had cancer. And it was not something I was expecting but it makes sense now because we were the only, you know, just a few nature paths. So I decided, well, I need to learn about these things because I really know a whole lot about it. And that just started this whole trip. And, and that's been the focus of my practice, as you've said, uh, since then, uh, including some uh, government funded cancer research and, you know, writing the books, all that, all that stuff. So that's the shortest version I can give you. Amazing. 
I'm happy to hear that you and your family got such good results and support from a local naturopathic doctor. That's that's so great to hear. And it seems like a lot of people get in the get their foot in the door that way is through someone they go to or family member. I hear that story a lot where it's either a personal health thing and that was the solution they found or family member was really impressed or something. So yeah, we're I think we're still pretty much a grassroots movement in, in naturopathic medicine. Did you have any mentors along the way that really kind of helped your trajectory into the spot you're in now? After this much time, there there have just been a, a lot of people at different junctures. In the early days when I was deciding should, you know, should I actually make this kind of large life change and kind of leave the business side of the medicine I was in, sell everything and go back to school. Um, that original uh, doctor in, uh, in Oregon, uh, Dr. David Brayman, uh, was very, very helpful. And he was really, he really laid things out, you know, not too flowery, not too negative, just this is what the, you know, this is what the business is like. And this is what you'll learn and all that. And he's on and off, you know, was a help along the way. Uh, and then a lot of uh, people from, you know, kind of that era. And it's just, you know, people come into your life at different times and they're there for, you know, a particular bit of help. What's, I think, interesting is because my family is actually, I'm the only naturopathic doctor. I have allopathic doctors in my family. Uh, I grew up around that, and so I, you know, I still really honor that system for what it's good at. And I had a lot of uh, open-minded allopathic doctors who are actually quite helpful too in my early career, just because I was doing so many things that were kind of on both sides of the line. Uh, and in Oregon, where I practiced, that was in the scope. You know, it was it was all what we did. So mentors were were just very very important. If you consider this is the days before the internet and and certainly before social media and everyone having access to people what i remember is you, you kind of used your mentors very sparingly because they were busy too and you usually had to call them or chase them down or physically find them you know you couldn't private message them i would run out of names to give of of people who have helped me what i really do appreciate though just the era that i kind of came into naturopathy was the older mentors that I had um, were from that era where they were directly mentored by people like Dr. Bastier and Dr. Terska and all of those, you know, people that you kind of read about. So, and some of those guys were still around when I was new. And so, you know, a little bit by proxy and a little bit directly, I actually got to benefit from some of those, you know, the, the real old timers, uh, which was a real blessing. Thanks for sharing your background and your mentor history there. So why don't we get right into the oncology conversation and I'd love to hear just sort of what you would like practitioners to know on what you've sort of learned over the last 30 years on sort of where to start or what what seems to help with a lot of the cases. I know that you know cancer is a very diverse disease with a lot of different expressions, but what have you learned and what would you like to share kind of in that general sense around oncology? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, even when you've worked with oncology a long time, it's a very overwhelming world, or it can be, because not only can you feel kind of confident with certain things you might know, but then new things come out, you know, almost every day or every week. And so there's always new twists. And so if you're, you know, if if you're starting with a longer background, yeah, that gives you a bit of a better uh, base, but there's always new things. You know, I mean, we learn new things like just earlier today, I looked something up for, for a doctor was asking me a question that happens a lot every day. Um, and I, I looked up a study and I don't even remember exactly which constituents it was. It happened to be about medicinal mushrooms and, uh, redox stability, uh, that was sort of related to, I won't go down that rabbit hole right now, but, and I, I read this thing and I had remembered reading some earlier research, but this was actually human research that really impressed me. And I was able to share it and say, I don't know if you've seen this or not, but this is pretty, you know, pretty amazing, but it's like even you know, having done research and looked into things to write books and all, 
there's stuff every day that's brand new. So I think as far as where to start, because it can be a little demotivating for someone who's done it a long time to say, well, just, you know, just do your best or whatever, you know, um, that that's a, it's like jumping in the ocean. And I think one of the things in, cause I see this all the time and I feel it in my own, you know, interaction with either patients or doctors is always remember the very basic things because the first job you have when a cancer patient or their family comes in and, and sits with you, whatever kind of healthcare practitioner you are, is to really just be clear on what is it that they really want from your involvement? Because normally you're not the only person. You might be one of many people you know, who are involved in the care. And that's a spectrum all the way from, you know, we've been told there's no hope and y- you can do whatever you want and you know, whatever, uh, all the way over to, well, you know, we're getting pretty good results with the standard treatment we have, but we have a lot of quality of life issues, or I'd really like to heal up from uh, my chemo that I had or my surgery or something of that nature to everything in between, you know, to literally people just wanting kind of one or two things from you. Um, And so the most important advice that I still give myself all the time is, remember to have that conversation and know your goals and their goals meet. Because then it makes your job a lot easier because if your focus now is, you know, healing after treatment, there's a lot of directions you can go there and you don't have to worry about a lot of other things. If they're coming in and they're in remission and they're saying, how do I stay healthy? You got a whole different, you know, ball ball of wax to, to deal with and, and a lot of directions to go. And so by knowing that to start with, number one, you do good medicine because you're meeting the patient where they're at. Also, you can clear up misconceptions. You know, I've had people come in and think, you know, that uh, there was some secret magic thing that would cure their cancer that I would do or whatever. And, you know, I, I would usually start and say, I've seen people have cures, but I never was, you know, that wasn't me. That was, you know, something else happening during care, you know, so that's not my goal. My goal is to where do we want to go? So you're really meeting them where they are, but then that narrows down your focus. So you're not trying to treat everything in their immune system or everything that's broken or, you know, whatever. Then once you know that and you and the patient have a meeting of the minds or in the family often, then you can kind of dive in and say, well, okay, it could be, you know, again, uh, let's just take a real common thing. I, th- I think in my practice, were people coming in after, you know, they were sort of on a break from chemotherapy and radiation. And they were saying, well, they said, I'm, you know, in remission at the moment, they're going to stop all the treatment. I don't want to just wait. What do I do? Those people, you kind of have a more open slate because there's not a bunch of other treatments going on. You're working on getting, you know, healing them from whatever damage there was, but also, you know, shoring up their immune function and repair. On the other hand, you get people that literally come and it's, you know, you you look at end of life and it's, that sounds very negative, but some of the most profound patient interactions I've ever had have been when people have said, well, you know, they told me there's just no more treatment or I'm too sick for it, but my goal is not to live forever. It's to be really present and uh, have as little pain and all of these things. Well, that is a huge gift to give somebody completely different things you might do there. So I really think uh, looking at it from the point of view is where's the patient in this giant spectrum of cancer, which is a lot of things, what do they really want? And then, you know, then you actually have a target you can go towards. People in the, the either, you know, natural medicine, integrative medicine, naturopathy, whatever area of health, you have so many tools that you can bring to bear once you know kind of where to focus them. Wonderful. Yeah, I really like that point about you know, having that initial connection or that initial attunement and really figuring out on both sides, like what we're here to do and how, to, how we want to go about that. That's, that's really special. It sounds like yeah. you can get a lot of um, goodies from that and start a treatment plan. Yeah. A lot of uh, agreement and yeah. Yeah. Go forward. It's, um, and it's surprising how much we assume and the patients assume. And if you don't have the conversation, you can really be on two different tracks. And I know because I, you know, I've done that and I just thought they understood what I was doing, but we never spoke about it. And you, 
you learn that the hard way sometimes. It's very, very important because that's a big part of healing is, uh, you know, you and the patient kind of being on the same wavelength with, with where you're going. Yeah, I'm sure you've gotten pretty good at that over the years on having those cohesive conversations with folks coming into your practice. Yeah, it, it, it is a, uh, it's, it's an art that you practice, but it's, it's a necessary, <laughs> necessary art. So you're mentioning medicinal mushrooms. So I just want to go right there and talk to you about how you sort of generally apply those to some of your cases. And if you had any specific examples, I'd love to share those with our, with our listeners. In my mind, and you know, this might be uh, just because of the way I sort of came into learning about medicinal mushrooms and there's been a lot of evolution in three decades around you know mushrooms and, and what we know and what they do and all that stuff um the idea of medicinal mushrooms in in my mind is both very like macro uh from the point of view of there's just especially now there's so many individual like mechanistic things we know about different you know parts of of mycology but then it's also so that can lead you to very you know like um i guess uh, specific focus sort of therapy so if you get somebody you know who's really over here there might now be some research about a particular mushroom that was really good in that kind of say cancer or an autoimmune or something like that but on the other hand i just just so people know the direction i'm coming from when we were sort of learning about mushrooms and mycology, a lot of information was sort of filtered through the Chinese medicine lens, which is really good information, but it's a very different sort of view of using those things. And, and then, of course, we had, you know, Western herbal uh, teachers and all. And what I can tell you is it was a lot less specific. There was a lot less uh, variety of products and things that were available, you know, and so you might, <laughs> you might make a uh, you know, a very arduous, uh, you know, decoction formula that you're having your patient do at home, or you might be giving them, you know, dried powders to they put into food and eat it and all kinds of stuff that, you know, you still do, but I think we do less of that nowadays. But the thing that I think I'm always impressed with whenever I go back and like, like this morning, looking for some information for a doctor, you know, when I look at the mycology, the medical mycology research, it's just, it's nonstop and it's always happening, you know. Um, and they're literally now we can look at mechanistic things that sort of match. Gee, clinically, we thought we were seeing that, you know, uh, and now it turns out they check that and it actually does that in people. So one of the things that I would talk to patients about this start with cancer, I think, because that's where we started with our discussion. Uh, but I, I like to use mushrooms in, in uh, you know, protocols in cancer, but also in a lot of immunologic things that are non-cancer. The first thing I would talk to the patient about is if there was some compelling evidence that a particular mushroom, like for instance, in our research, uh, I was involved with the IV therapy parts and all of that, and we weren't really doing mushrooms in IV therapy, but in our big research, which I was part of the group, we were doing specific mushrooms, turkey tail being one of them, for example. Um, and there was some compelling evidence that was seemed to be coming out with turkey tail in particular types of cancer. Not meaning that it wouldn't work on other, but it's just sort of what we were seeing. And you see this with studies. So sometimes I would have a patient and we say, you know, your, um, your cancer and you know, the way it's presenting and all, uh, if we're going to, you know, put time and money and effort into you getting some mushroom products into your life, we might want to start with something specific, say like turkey tail. In other folks, um, it might be, we used a lot of blends uh, of, of different types of mushroom. And I think that the benefit with those, at least in my mind, this is the story I told myself was, um, the blends sometimes pick up constituent benefits from a lot of different, you know, uh, mushroom product that kind of swims in the same direction, but maybe, you know, mushroom X and mushroom A overlap on two points, but cover a lot of other things. And I always resonated with that when we weren't, you know, 
when there wasn't like the the wonderful study that said, gee, they did this and their prostate PSA went down, you know, whatever. I like to start kind of general and kind of see how their body resonates with it because the way the immune system works is almost like chaos theory. Like there's just all these inputs and they all talk to each other and it's not all like out of balance one way or the other. It's this orchestra going on. And I really looked at mushrooms, especially as opposed to a lot of specific nutrients. Mushroom constituents sort of go in, and we think sometimes of, well, maybe some don't, but some people think of mushrooms are, well, they're going to be immune stimulating or something like that. A lot of their activity is modulating, and that's really more what you want. So in, in cases where modulation was important, I would tend to start with more broad things. In people, you know, whether it's cancer or, say, a, a chronic infectious patient whose immune system is really suppressed, sometimes some of the more, um, I guess, purified and extracted sort of, you know, products seem to work better in cases that were suppressed to kind of move them off. And I, I'm, this is by no means the end all be all, but example would be like AHCC or some of, you know, some of those uh, products that are just very, I mean, they're still pretty broad. They still do a lot of immune things, but they're they're more of a let's boost your system out of this suppression and then maybe we'll modulate it. So I really think, um, and there's very few, you know, certainly nutrients are very important. I mean, and obviously mushrooms have nutrients, but like if I'm going to give you a mixture of some B vitamins and other nutrients, it's going to do X, Y, and Z for you. If I give you a mixture of different types of mushroom products, it's going to do probably one to 300 things in your immune system. And it's just, it's, it's like a tool you, you, you can't really meet, even with other botanical things. There's things like, you know, Boswellia and curcumin and gingers and things that have a lot of effects. But I think compared to most mushrooms, it's, you know, still very narrow, more narrow. That's wonderful to hear you talk about the immunomodulating effect and how you can get a more specific or a more sort of, compre not comprehensive, but a more sort of, like you said, a widened lens on using that, um, the blends mm -hmm. and things like that when using medicinal mushrooms. So I assume there's probably some patients that don't do too well with them either, correct? When, you know, they might not react to them, they might not, or they might get triggered by them. Is that, is that something you've seen? I think one of the things, you know, when you're thinking of just first do no harm and I, because I've made this mistake too, <laughs> you live long enough, you make every mistake. You get people, there are people who have sensitivities or, or, or allergies of one kind or another to certain types of mushrooms. And so you do need to clear that up first, like that's the base level. Sometimes though, they'll say, well, I'll have, you know, in, in North America, it's it's more common now, but 20 years ago, like people eating mushrooms was a very <laughs> narrow, you know, it wasn't that that common. And the availability of a lot of the even culinary mushrooms that I can get at any store now, just that wasn't happening. And so when people would say, well, I, I you know, I don't know if I'm allergic, but I have these reactions, I would kind of drill down and say, well, what kind of mushrooms do you eat? You know, uh, because a lot of people, um, especially like you go back to my childhood in U.S., it was canned mushrooms, you know, which is kind of, in my mind, kind of gross. But anyway, or maybe it was bought mushrooms or it was whatever. Well, then you have to find out, because I've had this happen, did they actually get like histamine response type things or is it their gut might be so out of balance, et cetera, that either the microbiome in the GI tract when you're trying to digest the mushrooms you're eating is having a reaction. That certainly happens. Or sometimes if they were doing, like they may have heard, you know, that I'm going to start eating uh, more shiitakes, you know, in, in my diet because it's I heard that's good for me. Start having, you know, some pain or other things go on. Sometimes that's directly the bugs, the GI tract, you know, flora and the mushroom reacting. So certainly if they have that, we wouldn't want to start there. We might want to work on their gut and make sure that's, and then I've had a lot of those people, then it's fine. But if they truly had allergies, yes, you'd, you'd have to be a little bit careful. The other thing, because I get this feedback from doctors, sometimes they'll, you know, I'll talk about, like we were just talking about a minute ago with um, 
a suppressed system, whether it's from infection or cancer or cancer treatment a lot of times, and you might want to use a really potent you know, extract like HCC or one of the others and just kind of move it off the dime. Well, sometimes what happens with those often, which you have to warn the patient about, is your immune system might wake up faster than you imagine. Like these real strong extracts will do that. And what that means is if there's things that you haven't been fighting (laughs) because you have a suppressed immune system, the mushrooms or extracts or whatever will push you towards, you know, an immune fight. Well, immune fighting feels like you're getting sick. So people will freak out, you know, oh my gosh, I took this and then I felt like I got the flu or I got ache, joint aches or whatever. So it's really important uh, that, you know, practitioners, especially so they can tell patients, say, we believe you're really suppressed. This might take a few weeks or months to move. But I've seen in one week, people's immune system start to turn up. And what that looks like is you might feel like you're getting sick or your joints might ache or whatever. That's not that the mushrooms or the extracts are bad. It means we may have to back off on them and do more like modulating things. So there's a lot of that, you know, it's a lot of communication. And and I bring that up because that's, that's very common in suppressed people that their suppression goes away and then the immune function (laughs) happens. And they think they're reacting to the mushroom product, but they're really not. They're they're actually having an immune, you know, a response. Right. The body's just doing something like you said when it didn't have the vitality or the, the function mm-hmm. to do so. I think that's a really good point for some people, especially if you don't have that sort of background in the more clinical part of it. I've seen cases like that. I've literally had clinicians that, um, you know, they heard the part about what to use, but they kind of, I, I guess they didn't think maybe it would be that you know, dramatic sometimes. And then they get the patient feedback and they think, geez, was it like allergic or was it, you know, was it a bad reaction? And no, it's just actually that the immune system's working. And the times, I, you know, for the, like a clinician's thinking about this, the people I see this most in end of cancer therapies, which are often very immune, just draining, if not suppressive. So you're in a suppressed state and you're trying to not have, you know, a lot of, um, opportunistic infections after your chemo. That's a very common thing. Well, if they're sort of laying there with no immune reaction, but you've picked up a few opportunistic infections and suddenly you get an immune response, you feel like you're getting an immune response. Or you get people who, you know, have chronic infectious things like your chronic Lyme patient with four or five infections or whatever. They'll get so suppressed, same thing will happen. And, you know, you start that immune activity, and they feel pretty bad. So it's it's just more of a communication, adjusting doses, that sort of thing. Thanks for sharing that little tidbit of wisdom. When looking at the non-oncological uses of medicinal mushrooms, say population demographic of autoimmune patients, what is your opinion on using mushrooms there? Do you think they're always immunomodulating? Do you, again, just kind of do it case by case? you want to take us through your thought process around autoimmunity and mushrooms? Yeah. Or your just take on autoimmunity? Because I know you you dive in deep, deep, deep into the autoimmune world. Probably the reason why I do so much with autoimmunity is in, in that world of, you know, after the early part of my practice where it became very chronic illness oriented, it was either a patient with cancer or it was a chronically ill patient. And many of the chronically ill folks either were autoimmune or mixed autoimmune and other chronic problems. The way I try and put it in my brain just to keep everything straight is autoimmune biology and tumor biology have a lot of crossover with one another, but they sort of go in two different directions as far as disease expression, because you're working with the same immune system. It's just taking different trips. Again, to say uh, it becomes very patient specific. It's you know literally each patient will respond differently. And if you take if you take a hundred cancer patients, you know let's say, and you give them either you know a mixed mushroom uh, you know formula or maybe one of the more stimulating uh, isolates or whatever, you're you're going to have. 90 to 95 of those 100 people tolerate it really well and you know maybe you adjust a little bit you have 100 autoimmune people anything but especially something that affects the immune system on that many levels 
if you don't have a bit more finesse than you do often with cancer patients, you're going to have, you know, 80 of those people have some kind of reaction that they don't like or you weren't expecting or whatever. And and again, that like I was saying with infection, it doesn't mean it's bad. It means maybe we went too hard or maybe we didn't look at what else is going on. So in the concept, uh, trying to make it as short as possible, and as you know, it, it's never that short. If you think of an autoimmune human with, with their immune system is confused. The immune system is, now we look at things, you know, in research they'll look at, uh, well, is the TNF high or the IL-6 or, you know, we'll, we'll pick targets because we can research that. But for every one that we research, there's like 20 that they talk to and one autoimmune case might have 10 that are fine and 10 that are really on edge and the other person may be different. Well, if you look at a really broadly acting therapy, uh, you know, like in mycology, they go in and they might affect everybody. Okay. Now, if you take that on its own for the average, maybe non-autoimmune patient, they might feel a little rough or they might do whatever, but it may just be generally very immune supportive. In autoimmunity, if the system, because there's always triggers for autoimmunity. So if you think of autoimmunity as like the hub of the wheel, the spokes can be things like infections you don't know you have or toxicity or uh, you know, chronic sleep deprivation or poor diet or, um, you know, a million things can go on there. What I find is if the spokes of the wheel that make the autoimmune hub aggravated are not kind of being dealt with, you put something in like a broad-based mushroom supplement or especially like a, an isolate that's got a real you know, big immune punch, they will aggravate terribly. And it's not because it's bad for their autoimmunity. It's because these underlying things that trigger the autoimmunity are just not being dealt with. So kind of in the same way you might do with cancer, but, uh, but the more specific uh, direction is you look at the patients. So obviously you start with what does the patient want? But after that, if they have autoimmunity, you step back and say, has anything been done about anything that would make autoimmunity better or worse? Does anyone look for toxicity? Has anyone dealt with their gut and their diet? Has anyone looked at chronic allergies or you know all of these things? If those are swimming along pretty well and you're you, you're taking down the you know the aggravating factors, people don't have as much reaction to you know, immune modulating things. If you just go in, you know, kind of guns blazing, don't treat any of that stuff. You see this, uh, it's a lot of people have heard of this, so I'll use the example, it's not mushrooms. People with certain autoimmune conditions will aggravate with something like echinacea, right? And so you'll people be, well, don't give somebody with, you know, rheumatoid arthritis echinacea. Well, it's, it's not so much that, it's that that herb and others like it have immune modulating and shifting ability. And if you do that to somebody and underneath their RA, let's say there's some chronic infections, there's other stuff, they'll just aggravate. Same thing happens with mushrooms. If the case is more calm and then you're going in, and I'll just say my personal uh, you know, uh, choice to start in autoimmunity once I think I've worked on the other you know, contributing factors, are usually more broad, generalized sort of mushroom approaches, lower doses, and kind of work up, see if we're, is that going to, you know, fit the bill for them. Then you don't get as many reactions. Uh, but it, but it's, it's more the things that you don't see that are aggravating the autoimmunity that you would stir up with, with the mushroom therapy than, than the actual autoimmunity. I know it comes out as autoimmune, but yeah. Great. Yeah, that's really good to hear from my perspective even just to kind of rationalize those steps through my my clinical mind what are some of those things that often get kind of stirred up like you said you know you said it's a lot of gut it's a lot of toxicity a lot of stress are those kind of the big ones that you you start with and work work through in the initial so you know initial assessment you you might look at a lot of areas but the idea of looking at a lot of areas is not you're going to find something in all of them, but you just turn over as many rocks as you can. 
the areas that normally wind up being rocks you want to at least look under and say, oh, that's not a big deal or, oh, wow, there's, you know, there's a lot over here. The GI, the health of the GI tract, which can be hard to assess sometimes. People say, well, I have no trouble digesting or well, it's because they're so suppressed. They, they don't know that they're having trouble or their diet is down to 12 foods and that's keeping them stable. So the microbiome, but also just GI function, all of that is so huge because the immune system and the gut cross talks to everybody, right? So gut things, which could be, you know, dysbiosis or infections or SIBO or other whatever, all that's very important. And I think that's one of the foundational things that need to be looked at in, a, in an autoimmune case because they will tend to have something. Toxicity uh, is ubiquitous, but if I have underlying autoimmunity and that's my constitution, a little poison goes a long way. So looking at both acute exposures, am I, am I drinking, you know, water or other things that are, you know, pretty polluted? Am I eating a lot of, uh, you know, food that comes from, you know, industrialized farms that have a lot of junk on it, whatever? You know, those those go on in the background and we eat and drink every day. So we don't even think about it, right? So that's a big area. Chronic infections, I find in, in the cases that aren't going well that are autoimmune, often if people haven't looked at toxicity and chronic, let's say they did a good job with the GI tract and the diet is getting cleaned up and stuff that we often focus on first. If that's not really moving the needle, you really need to look at the, you know, the invisible stuff toxicity, chronic infections, all of that, because it's not like everybody gets exposed to most of the bugs that become chronic infections. But if you have autoimmunity, they may actually grow and be resident without a lot of symptoms, except that they're always there irritating your immune system. You know, so that sort of immunologic investigation is, is important. And then, uh, you, know, you know, there's other things related to those, but those are some of the big things. So what I usually look at is, gosh, if, if you clean up the diet and the gut and that helps 90%, you probably don't need to go looking in a ton of other places. You work on the diet and the gut and all the baseline things, and they still, like, they're just super reactive and their, you know, symptoms are not uh, then you really need to probably look deeper at these other things. So you don't always have to do everything with everybody, but in the people that aren't getting better, there's something you can't see. Wow, this time is just flying by. Um, can you let us know where we can find more information? And can you talk about your two books, Dr. Paul? Sure. So um, the f first one I, I think I mentioned, or you mentioned actually, uh, is uh, Outside the Box Cancer Therapies. It's uh, Dr. Mark Stengler and myself wrote that, and um, it's it's actually written. It's sort of a hybrid book. Um, it's written so any patient can read it and understand it. You don't have to have an advanced degree, but we referenced it like a textbook because the biggest thing, as you know, that people they go to maybe their oncologist or somebody, and they say, "I want to try, you know, mushrooms. I want to try something." And I'll say, well, I don't think there's any research on that. So we have just about 1,100 references in it. The publisher wasn't ready for that, but we re it's very well referenced. And like the oral supplement chapter, which is very extensive uh, and has a lot of the mushrooms and herbs and things, has well over 300 references just for that. You know, So there's a lot in there. Uh, a lot of clinicians use it just because it's easy route towards the studies too. So that one is is a lot about, uh, it's outside the box cancer therapies, but really it's about the whole world of the integrative cancer experience. And then the second one I wrote a couple of years later because we didn't have the space to devote in the, an outside the box. And it's, it's uh, this one just called Cancer, the Journey from Diagnosis to Empowerment. And it's uh, it is agnostic of how you treat your cancer. It's about you and your loved ones dealing with the, you know, this this overwhelming trauma of a cancer diagnosis. And instead of becoming traumatized, you know, and victimized by the uh, diagnosis, having a pathway to move towards being an empowered patient. And empowered patients have better quality of life. They can live longer. 
their therapies work better. You know, so there's a lot of benefit to being an empowered patient. So the second one, the cancer, the journey from diagnosis to empowerment is really about that internal journey uh, and, and navigating it because nobody wants to be diagnosed with cancer that I've ever met. And it's a huge trauma. It's trauma to your loved ones. And this just gives you a roadmap through the trauma to the other side. And it really, um, that one is a lot less research. There's, there is research about empowerment and all that, and I do put some in, but this is really from, this is directly from my experience and, and working with people and also just seeing people who are empowered do better. It's, it's a very critical factor. So those two books, you can get them anywhere where books are, uh, you know, online. Um, there is a, um, drabooks.com. That's drabooks.com. You can go there. You can read about all of them before you go to wherever you buy books or there's links. And, and then um, the practitioner website is consult DRA, just consult Dr. A, or you can put in, if you like to type, consult Dr. Anderson, dranderson.com. And there's a lot of uh, just free material on there that uh, things I've you know, done for research or other documents. That's just where they live. There's hundreds of them. Uh, and then there's CE there as well. So. Great. Yeah. I can definitely test to the quality of the resources Dr. Anderson's putting out for all the practitioners listening. And yeah, those two books sound great. You got your one that's more um, research backed. And then, yeah, that whole mind body empowerment interface sounds so mm-hmm. important and come from experience what do you what even better resource that is so thank you for just creating those resources for people to have and you sharing your your wisdom with the world is yeah it's really appreciated thank you very much this has been great